In the name of Jesus, who is the Lord of the church and the Savior of our souls, your fellow redeemed. Tell me, if you went uh, car shopping, what would you require that car to have? In terms of equipment, maybe, maybe you'd say, I, boy, it's just got to have like a towing package so I can pull my camper. Or it's, it's got to have a backup camera so I can actually back up <laughs> to my camper. Or it's got to have a, a sunroof or mag wheels or power everything. For me, if I'm buying a car, doesn't matter what make it is, no matter what model, no matter what color, it's got to have... A comfortable driver's seat. It's, if it's not cushy, if it doesn't rock back, if it doesn't have good lumbar support, I'm out. I need, I want a seat that's comfortable, that feels good. You realize that these days a lot of people shop for churches the same way they shop for cars. They're looking for what they want, whether it's a particular worship style or it's a certain message from the pulpit or it's programs for their children. And recognize that it's not necessarily wrong to evaluate individual congregations on the basis of criteria like these. But we need to recognize that there's there's a difference between shopping for a church and shopping for for a car. I mean, if I buy a car, it's mine. I own it. The church, on the other hand, I don't own. God does. In fact, Scripture says Jesus bought the church with his own blood. And that means before I think in terms of this is what I want in a church, Maybe I ought to ask, God, what do you want? What do you want your church to be and do? How do you want your people to think and speak and act? We are conducting a sermon series that's focusing on these very things. Not so much what we want in a church, but what God wants. And last week, we learned that God wants a church that is quick to forgive sins. And certainly, that's a good thing. But sometimes, people equate forgiving sins with ignoring them. Sometimes, people think, I want a church that doesn't judge people. I want to be able to do what I want to do. I, I, I want a church where everybody just minds their own business. Wait a minute. If, if, what if I belong to that church and I start to go astray? What, what if I, I start to do things that are, are damaging my relationship to God? What if by my sins, I'm putting my eternal life in jeopardy? Would God's church say, oh, well, whatever, God, guess we lost another one. I, I, we, we can't do anything about that, can't say anything about that, wouldn't want to offend anybody. No. God's church would take action. God's church would say what needs to be said, even if it's hard to say, even if we don't want to hear it. God's church, the church that God has, is a church that speaks hard things. Or to put it another way, God's church is a church that confronts sinners. Confronts them first in love for their souls and confronts them with the authority of God. Our text is taken from Matthew chapter 18. This whole chapter is focusing on how Christians need to care about the faith 
of their brothers and sisters in Christ, especially faith that is weak or is in danger of being lost. He, for example, begins by saying, if, if you lead a brother into sin, lead them to stumble in their faith, it'd be better if you were drowned at the bottom of the sea. And then he tells a parable about a shepherd that leaves 99 sheep to go for that one that is straying and rejoices when he brings it home. In fact, Jesus ends that section by saying, in the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. It's against that backdrop of Jesus' heartfelt love for the straying that he makes this application for our lives today. He says, if your brother or sister sins, Go and point out their fault just between the two of you. Now, at first blush, we might say, what? (laughs) Point out their sin? That's love? (laughs) Doesn't sound like something very loving to me. Well, before we get off the track here, let's clarify a couple things. First of all, recognize he says, if your brother or sister sins... He's not talking about necessarily the members of your immediate family. He's talking about the members of your spiritual family, brothers and sisters in Christ. In other words, Jesus is not saying, boy, your job is to go out there and point out the sin of every unbeliever in the world. No. But if someone that you regard as a brother or sister in Christ is caught in a sin then you owe it to that person to point it out. But notice he says, point it out just between the two of you. In other words, our job is not to tell other people about what that person did. Did you hear what she said? Can you believe that? No, our job is to go to that person alone. Why? Because that's how we protect a person's good name. If we can deal with this matter privately, then their reputation is maintained. Now, does that mean I I should never talk about anybody to somebody else? Is is it a sin if I say, for example, boy, did you ever realize that that Charlie never combs his hair? Or how, how come Susie's always late? That's not wrong. I mean, I'm not accusing them of sin. Their, their, their soul is not in eternal jeopardy because they have bad hygiene or their poor management of, of time. No. But sin, on the other hand, especially deliberate sin, is what destroys faith. It's a different story. We need to point out their faults. And what's the purpose of that? To make them feel bad. To shame them. To make yourself feel better because you're not falling into that sin. No. The whole purpose is to help them see whether their behavior lines up with God's will for a Christian. To help them see the damage that their sin is causing on their relationship to God. Maybe that's when a friend of yours from church invites you over to her house for a party, and by the end of the night, she's saying things that she would never say if she were sober. Or maybe it's your husband who just goes off the handle just loses it, is berating you, is terrifying the kids, and the next day, it's like nothing happened. Maybe it's your daughter who who says she's a follower of Jesus, but she's moving in with her boyfriend anyway. Or your son who claims to be a Christian but never gathers with them in worship. In each case, we owe it to them to say something, even if it's hard, even if 
they don't want to hear it. There's just too much at stake. A, a soul, an eternal blood-bought soul is at stake. Think about it this way. If, if you happen to wake up in the middle of the night, look across the street, and you see smoke coming out of your neighbor's house, and the, both cars are there in the driveway, so you know they're there, do you say, oh, man, wouldn't want to bother them in the middle of the night? Right? Maybe they're sleeping. Oh, that, they, if I woke them up, they'd be all agitated. No. You would run over to their house. You'd pound on the door. You'd throw a rock through the window because their lives are at stake. You do what it takes to rescue them. Isn't the same thing true for human souls? Christian love compels us to do what it takes to rescue them even if it means pointing out their sin. But recognize a real goal is not simply to point out sin, but rather to point people to God's solution to their sin. Right? Just, just leading a person to recognize that what they did was wrong won't save anybody. I mean, Judas knew what he did was wrong. I mean, he committed suicide for it. The trouble is he, he didn't believe what Jesus had done for him. That means that when we go to people who are struggling with a sin, we need to bring two messages. First, what you did was wrong, and here's what God did about it. He had Jesus die for it. Jesus stands now with open arms waiting to bring you home. He, he's waiting to forgive you. In fact, in fact, he already has. The only question is, will you believe him? Will you let go of your sin and cling to your Savior. If by God's grace, your brother or sister in Christ says, yes, I will, well, then you can share some great news. I mean, in fact, what, is, what does Jesus say? If they listen to you, you have won them over. Literally, you have you've gained something what, 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 what once was lost has now been found. In other words, Jesus is, is saying that really any sin, if left unrepented, destroys faith. In a sense, it's not the size of the sin that matters. God to, to God, all sins are equal. It's our attitude about the sin. If, if a fellow churchgoer, rather than confessing a sin and renouncing it, says that they want to defend it and, and hang on to it and keep doing it, well, then God says that person is not a believer. And he tells us we need to tell them as much. How does Jesus put it? If they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. In other words, acknowledge that by their behavior, by their attitude about their sin, they are outside of the kingdom. They are not believers. Man. That's a little scary. Who, 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 who would give you the authority to make that kind of judgment call? God would. You see, God's church is a church that confronts sinners. Yes, in love for their souls, but also with the authority of God himself. How do we know that? Because Jesus tells us, truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. 
What is Jesus talking about there? Binding and loosing? He's talking about our children's lesson. He's talking about the keys to the kingdom. He's talking about the fact that he gives you as a Christian the authority to tell the penitent sinner that his sins are forgiven and tell the impenitent sinner that they're not. When I used to teach eighth grade catechism class, I would illustrate this fact by bringing into the classroom a set of vice grips. And I'd take my dirty handkerchief and I'd clamp it to the shirt of one of the students. And I'd say, this is what happens when you don't repent of your sins. They become bound to you. They are clamped to you. Wherever you go, you are stuck with them. And don't take my word for it, because if I say they are stuck to you, God says the same thing. That's what Jesus means when he says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Now, wait a minute. Does that mean that God will do whatever I tell him to do? If I say it, God's going to back me up. I, I, I can force God's hand. No. Rather, I'm simply announcing something that God has already decided. In fact, Jesus uses a rather unique Greek form here. Literally, these words say, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Technically, that's, that's a future passive verb form. We, it, it means this has already been decided in the future. You and I don't talk like that, but this is what God gives us the authority to do, to say to the impenitent sinner, your sins are not forgiven. That's what God has decided. Again, why would a church say that to anybody? It feels so unloving because we have a purpose. And the purpose is to lead that person to see what's really happening here so that by the grace of God, they can say, I blew it. I messed up. I am sorry. God, have mercy on my soul. And then, then we get to do what only God's church can do. We get to apply the loosing key. We, we get to unlock the vice grips and say, your sins, they are gone. God has dumped them to the bottom of the sea. He is no longer holding them against you. You are now in God's good grace, you are a child of God. I can tell you with the voice of God himself that you are forgiven. My friends, when a church does that, when a church cares enough about its souls to speak the hard things and then to speak with the authority of God to tell them that their sins are forgiven, well, that church is not only a church that God wants, it's a church which deep down everybody wants. It's a church that by God's grace and by the power of the Holy Spirit, you already are. God grant it. For Jesus' sake, amen. Thanks so much for worshiping with us today. We hope that God's word has strengthened your faith. 
to help us know more about the reach of our efforts here at Mount Health, we hope that you'll like and subscribe to our YouTube and Facebook pages and that you also sign our online friendship register to let us know that you're listening today. God bless and keep you.